I want to begin by acknowledging uh, that we're sitting here today at Kensington uh, in the beautiful uh, seminar room at the law school, um, the, the Faculty of Law and Justice on Aboriginal Land. I want to pay respect uh, to the Bidjigal people uh, who are the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today and to elders past, present, emerging and to lend my voice along with others to calls from First Nations at Uluru for structural change to the constitution to enshrine voice to parliament. My name's Rosalyn Dixon. I'm the director of the Gilbert and Tobin Centre for Public Law. People in the room know that, but it's lovely to see so many people joining online. And I'm joined today by a really uh, wonderful guest and co-host. My co-host uh, for the event, the Gilbert and Tobin Centre has partnered with the uh, Transnational Law and Policy Centre at Wollongong um, and Associate Professor Marcus Wagner to host this event. Thanks, Marcus, for Thanks joining for us me. and for the collaboration. Uh, Marcus is not only a globalist, but someone who uh, uh, studied and taught at the University of Miami in the United States before joining us on the east coast of Australia. And our guest today is Professor Amanda L. Tyler, who's the Shannon C. Turner Professor of Law at Berkeley. Amanda has written about a whole range of issues pertaining to constitutional law, federal courts, civil procedures, statutory interpretation, um, and written on a range of scholarly topics. But her most uh, salient uh, writings, if you like, for today's conversation about the Supreme Court are in part around um, her work with the former Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, they wrote a book together, uh, Justice, Justice Thou Shalt Pursue, um, in 2021. And of course, Amanda was um, Justice Ginsburg's clerk, um, you know, a, few, a, short, a short few years ago. Uh, <laughs> so Amanda, we're delighted that you're in Australia and we're very lucky that you've um, agreed to join us today. Thank you very much. Um, and we want to talk to you a little bit about um, the, the court, the US Supreme Court, where it is, uh, some of its very significant, controversial recent decisions and where it might be going. Before we do that, I just want to acknowledge um, that we have a number of people online who have expressed great enthusiasm for your visit. Um, I wanted to note Justice Kunz, who is the editor of the Australian Law Journal, who wanted to draw our attention to an excellent piece um, on the US Supreme Court that's in either the current or most recent ALJ and that Tam Allenby, our wonderful centre administrator, has posted on our website, which we'd invite you to have a look at. Thank you so much, Tam, for all your work putting together today and another great event. Um, so, Amanda, you know, one could take a different a set of views on this depending on who you listen to, but we're here to listen to your view. What do you think? Is the Supreme Court of the United States in crisis? You know, I think that's a really good question. Um, I thought a lot about it. I think it's a fair assessment. Let me back up first and say thank you so much for having me. It's just a privilege to be here with all of you and to be with you too um, and those who are joining online uh, to your question. There are many reasons why someone might say that the court is in crisis. And I think they boil down to four. One, they are very out of step with public opinion on a number of very prominent issues. I wanna pause for a moment and say, there, we wouldn't, we wouldn't say that is necessarily automatically means they're wrong. Because of course their charge is to uphold the constitution even when it conflicts with popularly elected uh, pieces of legislation. But they are very far out of step with popular opinion on a number of very important issues, guns, abortion, climate change, to name a few. Um, where I think things get more alarming are when you look at the broad sweep of recent decisions, you see a court, and I'm primarily referring to a majority of the court, that cares very little about precedent, which I would say is very problematic, that has jettisoned in some respects, longstanding procedural traditions and norms, which I would also label as very problematic. And that is increasingly divided, uh, divided is the wrong word, displaced, disconnected from how law functions on the ground. How, in other words, how their decisions play out in the real world. And that also I would submit is, is alarming. So just to give quick examples, and then probably we'll refer back to a lot of these things in the 
the concrete discussion we're going to have because I know some of the cases we're going to cover. Um, but on the precedent issue, obviously precedent is going to come up in our conversations. We're going to talk about Dobbs. There's no way we're not going to talk about the recent abortion case. Um, that jettisons two huge precedents, one of which is reaffirmed, right? Roe reaffirmed in Casey. But it's not just in the high profile cases. The cases that make the front page of the New York Times that we see the court revisiting longstanding precedents. It's happening in the bread and butter cases too, a lot, a lot more than normal. So to give two very quick examples, just this last term in a case involving uh, the question whether uh, the Miranda warnings are constitutionally required under American law. I, I, I'm hoping a lot of people know what the Miranda warnings are just from TV, right? So you get arrested and you have to say you have the right to remain silent, you have the right to an attorney. In the wake of the Miranda decision, it was litigated and contested over whether that is required, those words are required by the Constitution. There were a series of decisions that said, no, it's just a prophylactic rule. Whatever a prophylactic constitutional rule is, I still don't know. This all comes to a head the year actually I clerked at the Supreme Court in a case called Dickerson, where the court not unlike Casey revisiting Roe, has to finally come back and say, okay, what did we really mean? Is this really constitutionally required? And in Dickerson, the court said, yes. That was in 2000. This last term, we now have a majority of the Supreme Court saying, no, actually Miranda's just prophylactic again. So that's an example. Another quick example, there's a recent case called Castro Huerta, which involves the issue whether a state you know, a sub-government within our federal government can prosecute non-Indians for committing crimes on Native American reservations. To anyone who knows uh, the long arc of Native American law in, in, the American, uh, in the United States of America, you would assume the answer is an obvious no because of tribal sovereignty and states are not supposed to have authority on tribal reservations, only the federal government does. But the Supreme Court says actually they do in a shocking opinion. So those are just two examples that probably you haven't read about where we see the court jettisoning precedent. The other thing I would just say uh, quickly, and then we can refer back to some of these things, on the procedural norms, this court is taking and deciding really salient issues on its emergency docket, what we call, some of us call the shadow docket, without full briefing, without argument, without submission of important amicus briefs. And during the COVID pandemic in particular, decided a number of really important religion issues, creating new law, which it has never done on its emergency docket. Um, and so that is really significant. And then you put that on top of the fact that this court, starting a few years back, and, and let me just underscore the statistics are staggering as to how different these trends are from the past. I mean, they're really unbelievable. The other thing the court is doing is taking cases directly from the trial court and allowing them to bypass the, the circuit court's court of appeals in our federal level, the middle appellate court. And that is something we haven't seen really ever. And they're doing it a lot. They're taking cases and not allowing the intermediate appellate courts to have a say on really important issues. So when you throw all of these things together, I'm not sure it's unfair to say that the court is in crisis, at least from where I sit, there are a number of red flags and, and things that are very concerning with what's going on. It's interesting though, because if you take your four factors, right, some of them might be sort of seen as radically ideological, a departure from longstanding precedent, but quote, making the Supreme Court great again. Uh, turning it far right, but in a way that would not be seen by some number of the public as a problem, but rather as deeply ideological. The crisis comes in when the public and relevant elites start to see it as all of this adding up to a crisis in legitimacy. Are you, are you there yet? Is, or is there enough of a sense either in the elites or on the ground to say, this is a court that has lost its way? Or is there enough support from you know, MAGA Americans for a Supreme Court refinding its way? That's, that's a really interesting question because it obviously is gonna depend who you ask as to what perspective you're gonna get. But the, the level of support for the Supreme Court 
in public opinion polls is the lowest I've ever seen it by, by leaps and bounds, which should, I think, give the court some pause. And I do think it gives John Roberts pause. I think as Chief Justice, he's very concerned about this. He's very much an institutionalist. And I think we'll get to Dobbs. I think that explains his opinion in Dobbs because no one ever thought Chief Justice Roberts was a big fan of Roe, let's be clear. But he does write a separate opinion in Dobbs saying, whoa, 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 hold on. We don't need to do that here. And I think it's because he's very concerned about it. Um, I think when you talk to, I don't know, entirely how we're going to define elites. So I'm going to put that word to the side. But if you talk to legal scholars um, like myself who follow the Supreme Court, what you hear more and more is that people are actually genuinely open to revisiting how we populate our Supreme Court, the structure, the size, maybe revisiting life tenure. And that's a first. Uh, I'm, you know, since I've been studying the court 20 years, this really has only gained traction in the last few years. So I think when you combine those two things and, and you have those, at least those two perspectives, not that they represent everybody, <laughs> clearly, but um, the people on the ground are concerned and people who study the court are concerned, it, it does give pause. Can I just jump in here? Uh, and, and thanks, Ross, for having me. And let me just play devil's advocate because I'm not subscribing to the view that I'm now just going to put forth, right? But couldn't you say the reverse was true in the Burger year, right? So 1969 till 1986, I think, Burger Court, relatively progressive. And isn't what we're seeing now the rollback of that, right? So I'm just trying to see, is there some kind of legitimacy that you can say from the other side, right? And I sort of draw on my own experience at the Israeli Supreme Court as a clerk where that very similar sort of debate has been had once Barack moved out of his position mm -hmm. as president. Of, uh, so is there an equivalence or does that, is there now a distinction where you say this is a qualitatively different move that the court is making? I would submit it's qualitatively different because of how dramatic the changes are and how quickly they're coming. Um, huge decisions are, and huge long-standing precedents will probably, if time permitting, talk about in the religion context, huge swaths of religious precedents are being thrown out related to the establishment clause. So, you know, we can go through each and, and, and in the administrative state, I know we're going to hopefully talk about that. There are some really benchmark cases that are in jeopardy and new theories being interjected to really limit the power of the administrative state to confront climate change and do other things. It's so much so quickly and so quickly on the heels of a change in the population of the Supreme Court that that is what I think is fueling so many different perspectives being concerned. And, and I, I don't think we've seen that really since the 1930s. So let's talk about Dobbs. Sure. It's the one case everyone's heard of. Uh, <laughs> tell us about briefly the, the reasoning and the decision and the reaction to it. So the reaction is, is going to play out for years. So we'll get to that. But the, you have a, a host of decisions. The lead opinion is written by Justice Alito. It's the opinion that was leaked with very minor changes. And that itself is an extraordinary sub story here, the leak, unprecedented. Outcomes of cases have been leaked, but not actual draft opinions. That, that really was just extraordinary. So who leaked who it? it? So who was it? Uh, we don't know. Could be the left trying to put pressure. Could be the right trying to lock it in. Hard what's, to know. What's your bet? My bet, mm, <laughs> off the record, is I think it's the right trying to lock it in. But I'm sure people would say, "Oh, you're biased. You you clerked on the left. That, you right? would say that." Yeah. Um, a lot of people do think it was probably a clerk. I think that's probably likely because they're there for one year and then they move out. Somebody who's permanent staff, unless they're planning to leave the building. I don't know, but uh, this, is, this, this is crystal ball game. Yeah. Right. But do you think that this was done at the behest? If you were to subscribe to the view that it was done by the right in order to cement, you cannot walk back. Was it done at direction or? I would be surprised. I would be surprised if a justice had any involvement in this. Um, even a hint. Even a hint. I, I would be, but 
I, I have a feeling we'll never know. We'll never know, uh, would be my guess if we don't know at this point. So the opinion that comes out very interestingly is very little changed from the opinion that was leaked. And, and that is significant. Clearly he had the votes, he locked them in for better or worse, and there they are. The, um, there are so many interesting things. I mean, we could spend the whole time yeah, talking exactly. about Dobbs. So I'm trying very hard to be efficient. Um, the, the sum total of, of what Alito's opinion does is he takes a track, a line of reasoning, which if you follow it can go very far to slash and burn forgive the expression, a host of 20th century precedents about privacy. The thinking or the line of reasoning behind the opinion in Dobbs is that abortion is not in the text of the Constitution. And although through the due process clause, which was the basis of this line of precedent, of the protection of the right to have the choice whether to carry a pregnancy to term, he says we only uphold protections of rights through the due process clause if they are part of tradition. If there is a longstanding traditional uh, protection of, of a right that is quote, deeply rooted in history. And then he proceeds to lay out why he believes there is no such story or claim to be made with respect to abortion. It's criminalized in various ways throughout the union at various points in time. He oversteps quite significant nuances in that story. He oversteps nuances in the story of reconstruction, but you know, putting that to the side, you asked me to describe the opinion. He says, yes, the argument is we have to adhere to stare decisis, but we don't always do that. And some of our most celebrated opinions throw out precedents. Brown versus Board of Education is the poster child for this over, overruling separate but equal and getting rid of desegregation of our public schools in 1954. We all hold that out as one of our greatest decisions. So he says, you know, if it was okay in Brown, why isn't it okay here? Um, he says, notwithstanding the line of reasoning adopted, that we're not going to go after Griswold, the case that protects the right to contraception. We're not going to go after Obergefell that protects the right to same-sex marriage. They are safe. And Except other for Justice Thomas, right? Well, and Kavanaugh writes a concurrence and he says, yes, those are safe. Thomas comes around and writes a concurrence and says, oh no, because the line of reasoning that you've laid out is right. There's no such thing as what we call substantive due process. Due process protects procedural rights. And as such, let's overrule Obergefell. Let's overrule Griswold. Let's overrule Lawrence. And so, um, you know, which is it? And the dissent says, which is it? The line of reasoning that you've laid out does put those cases in jeopardy. You say they're fine. So you're either being hypocritical or in and inconsistent or you're hiding the ball. And time will tell. There's a big debate now about particularly Obergefell uh, the same-sex marriage case, what will happen, I think it'll be up in front of the court very quickly. And I think it will because I made reference to the emergency docket. I can see a county clerk in a state who, who believes uh, that there's, this is an objectionable thing. They will refuse to issue a license and we'll see a case fast-tracked up to the court and we'll find out very soon whether Obergefell is safe. So November is going to matter a lot to the answer to the next question, but what comes next for women's rights and specifically access to reproductive health care? I mean, the events of the last week in Kansas might be seen as somewhat encouraging. What's your prediction about uh, how this will kind of settle at the state and also the federal level? It's, it's hard to make a prediction at the federal level, but I think the story that emerges from this case and from many other cases, the gun rights cases, the climate change context, time and again, what we're seeing for better or worse, and it depends on your perspective, I mean, my perspective is probably fairly clear, uh, is this Supreme Court wants out of the business of all of this. And it wants to kick as much back as possible to the political process, both at the state level and at the federal level. And for abortion, what that means is unless Congress at the federal level gets involved, this will be a state by state issue. And you have a number of states, I think it was 13 or so that had so-called trigger laws. The moment Rose overruled, immediately abortion restrictions go into effect. 
We think roughly at the end of all of this in about half of the 50 states, abortion in some form will be illegal um, in some states across the board, in some states with some exceptions, maybe for rape and protecting the life of the mother. Query as an aside, how do you decide whether someone was raped in that very quick window of time? Um, and who decides? These are really hard questions. Um, same questions with life of the mother. In any event, um, so it will depend on the state. The big issue that will come up there, again, if there is no federal legislation is can you cross state lines to get an abortion? Can your state criminalize you from doing so? Kavanaugh and his concurrence in Dobbs says no. Well, I mean, we'll see. There is a constitutional right to travel in our, in our constitution, so it should be legal. You should not be able to be prosecuted for that, but who knows? At the federal level, it's really hard to predict because all these years, 50 years, there's been no federal legislation except for legislation banning particular procedures, um, which was upheld. And that is significant because it suggests that this could run in two directions. If the Republicans control the White House and Congress and pass legislation criminalizing abortion throughout the United States, on that precedent, it suggests that the court would uphold such a law. And suddenly, even in California, where I come from, which is very liberal, there will be no right to abortion. Conversely, if the federal, uh, if the Congress were to protect a right to abortion, that would obviously preempt any contrary state law. And so the right to abortion could be throughout the government, uh, throughout the country. But we live in a time when the United States Congress passes very little legislation. And that is a huge problem, a huge practical problem with sending everything to that arena. Of course, one, you know, one of the most radical proposals coming from, um, you know, Senator Liz Warren and AOC is about building um, on federal land abortion clinics. I sent you a note um, about the, the proposal I tried to run about funding um, abortion federally through reconciliation as a means of legalizing. Do you think any of those kind of wacky, crazy alternatives have any legs? I don't think they're wacky or crazy, um, but I think it. I think it's more likely that if at, if they're going to do anything, the Congress would confront it head on. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. So your former boss probably is glad she didn't live to see this day. Uh, some people might say, well, it's partially her fault, right? Which is if she'd stepped down sooner, uh, we wouldn't have had Justice Coney Barrett adding her voice to the majority. What do you make of that? You know, what would Ruth Bader Ginsburg think or say? And uh, in particular, what would you say in her defense uh, about the timing question? So I'm gonna separate those out. I think they're very different issues. The first is what would she make? She would be very upset with the direction the court is taking for two reasons. One, I've outlined procedural irregularities. She was a civil procedure professor. She believed in procedural integrity as the backbone of any legal system. And she was and, and would be up in arms about the court doing so many things, taking cases straight from the trial court, taking cases of great importance and fast tracking them instead of having full briefing and argument and changing the law through the emergency docket, um, as opposed to protecting precedent and applying it as is the practice in the emergency docket. In particular, with respect to Dobbs, she would say this is taking us backward 50 years. And she would say that because a cornerstone of her advocacy for gender equality was the belief, and, and it was a belief that she held very deeply that a woman will never be equal if she does not have control over her reproductive choices. And I say this knowing this was so important to her because as, as you mentioned, we worked on a book together in the last year of her life. And one section of the book is her favorite opinions. And I asked her, I said, if someone coming to, to study your legacy were only to read a handful of opinions that you wrote, which ones would you want them to read? And they are about gender equality, voting rights, gender equality, <laughs> and reproductive freedom. And three of them are dissents. So she saw where the, the court's direction was going. And I like to think she sort of left uh, uh, marching orders for the work ahead. But she would be very, very 
despondent at, at, at the direction things are going. Now, the separate issue of her uh, leaving the court in the untimely way that she did. I understand why people are upset. I, I very much do. Um, when she died, the timing of it, for those who knew her personally, was devastating. It was especially devastating because for someone like me or any of her clerks who clerked at the court, who study and, and work in constitutional law, we knew we weren't just losing somebody who was a, a cherished mentor and a very important person in our lives. We understood the significance for the country. And so it was devastating on a scale. I, I don't know that I'll ever fully recover from that grief, to be, to be honest. That being said, I think the, the attacks on her are a little unfair. It won't surprise you to hear me say that, um, but they're unfair for a few reasons. One is when she did first contemplate stepping down while Obama was president, her doctors gave her a complete clean bill of health and said, you are totally and completely cancer free. And so I do think, I do know that that factored in part into the decision to stay. I do also know that she was planning to step down if the 2016 election had gone differently. And so that brings me back to the 2016 election. The number one reason people voted for Trump in exit polls was the Supreme Court. It was a much, I think it was like number five in the list of reasons for why people came out to vote for Hillary Clinton. And people were on, from the left were pulling voters from Hillary Clinton. And so there was this lack of appreciation, I think, on one side that this was a huge issue. And that was just very uninformed. And so for me, it all comes down to the 2016 election. Because you, look at, you had to look at the ages of the justices, including her, but others, and understand, based on the crazy system that we have of life tenure, <laughs> that there are likely to be openings in the next four years, and also that there are likely to be uh, justices who may want to retire, like Anthony Kennedy, who was put on by a Republican and likely isn't going to leave unless there's a Republican. And Anthony Kennedy was pro-abortion, pro-gay rights. So if you give 2016 to the Republicans in the presidential election, you may see him retire and be replaced by somebody far to his right, which lo and behold is what happened. And, and also at that very time, there was an open Supreme Court justiceship from Justice Scalia's death. death. So we already knew one was for sure up for grabs. So for me, it all comes back to that election. And that begs the question, which you know, time permitting, we'll get to whether we write, write, whether we have, excuse me, the right system for composing our court. Almost surely not. Um, now, gun control almost got eclipsed as soon as we kind of were reading about Bruin and the decision. We had Dobbs, and so a lot of people, especially outside the United States, kind of missed it. But the decision struck down, you know regulations that might have been seen to be uh, consistent with Hella and which prevented people uh, carrying a handgun in public uh, in New York without, quote, a very good reason, essentially. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's any implications of Bruin in practical terms for regulation at the federal level? Is it going to bite more regulations in blue states that have helped protect public safety? Is this one of the decisions that's kind of symbolically really bad, but practically not? Or is it going to have real practical consequences? That's a great question. Um, oh, your questions have been great, but that's a particularly good one. You know, is how upset should we be about this decision? Because in practical, practical terms, is it going to make a difference? So, you know, in brief, in Heller, the Supreme Court says there's an individual right to bear arms that's guaranteed by the Second Amendment to our Constitution. People are still debating whether that's the right reading of the Second Amendment without replowing that ground. In Bruin, the court, in an opinion by Justice Thomas, really digs in and says um, there's really limited room for regulation of core traditionally protected rights to firearm ownership. And history is determinative. And so there's a similar line of reasoning to Dobbs. We're looking backwards to historical tradition 
Interestingly, along the way in Bruin, the court strikes down a 100 year old law, but apparently that's not historical enough. It's, it's rather young in the history of our country. Certainly for Justice Thomas. So, right? For Thomas, yes. Yeah. So, you know, our country is over 200 years old. So, um, as is our constitution. So um, it's very interesting because the line of reasoning of the opinion, like I said, is very tradition oriented, very historically oriented. We call this originalism as a theory of, in of interpretation. I don't know how prominent it is here. I'm hoping to learn a lot more from all of you. We've had at um, least one originalist in recent times. Okay, well, we've got a lot of them now and, uh, and they control the Supreme Court. And so what that means is he changed the way we evaluate gun uh, regulations in the lower courts. There had been some room for considering governmental interests in regulation. He says, no, it's very simple. If there's a traditional right to self-defense and owning a handgun for that, anything that regulates that at all, it falls, period. Uh, my Dean, Erwin Chemerinsky, a prominent scholar of American constitutional law, says this is stricter than strict scrutiny. This is as rigorous a scrutiny. Nothing's going to pass this test if it touches on such a right. So on the one hand, I would say it's quite significant, notwithstanding a, a very odd concurrence by Samuel Alito saying we haven't actually decided very much in this case. And then he takes pot shots at the dissent by Breyer that opens by saying, I wrote this down, and this is the opening sentence in 2020, 45,222 Americans were killed by firearms. So you can see this is a case where in the opinions, the uh, sort of um, poor relationships among the justices are starting to play out publicly. In any event, uh, I digress as I sometimes do, I forgive me. Uh, the decision is a big deal in terms of the interpretive approach as a legal matter, but as a practical matter, I don't think it is. I don't think it is one, because the majority opinion says we're still going to recognize that historically there were regulations of firearms in so-called sensitive places, courthouses, curiously enough, schools, places like that. And you get a concurrence that doubles down on that and says, yes, it's very important to recognize you can still regulate in sensitive places. You can still regulate um, high capacity firearms, machine guns, et cetera, that aren't traditional firearms. They don't have protections. And where does that leave us? In the same place we've been. I mentioned earlier that I'm gonna keep referring back to the political process a lot of things are getting kicked over to the political process. So there is a lot of room for some regulation, assault weapons bans, et cetera, but there's no will to actually pass those laws because our Congress is just not that active. And so the practical effect of this decision is it's really just not that significant in the day-to-day -day reality of, of gun issues in America, which are, I don't need to tell a foreign audience, an emergency. Right. So on that not optimistic note, let me switch gears a little bit. Um, and and also actually the order we, we we were going to talk about this, but because you were talking deeply rooted in history, right? So, yeah. Um, the deeply rooted in history bit, I think, leads nicely over into religion. Mm. Right. And we have uh, now a case with uh, Kennedy and Bremerton that seems to also overturn what we thought was the art query whether that's true or not so maybe you want to comment on that but the one thing that really strikes me about uh the bremerton case or kennedy case whatever we want to call it um is that the justices don't seem to be able to agree on the facts <laughs> right so you see a very unusual thing namely that there's all of a sudden pictures being it's not yeah. the first time but there's pictures being put into the actual opinions right to show that there's this maybe for the audience, kneeling uh, and leading prayer after the conclusion of a football match, right? But there seems to be a disagreement over whether this was forced, not forced, whether you could play if you were not part of the in crowd of, of prayer. What do we make of that? Uh, going back and in, into deeply rooted history. Yeah, so there are a lot of moving parts to this case, Kennedy um, versus Bremerton. It's about a, an American football coach at a public high school. And so at a public high school, publicly funded school, the First Amendment applies and restricts the ability to establish religion. Longstanding precedent and a lot of longstanding precedent would suggest this is 
deeply problematic to have the football coach go out on the 50 yard line at the conclusion of the game, take a knee and pray. And that there would be a coercive effect on the young students and the players who want playing time. I have an athletic background, so I can empathize with this line of argument. You want to play, you want to make your coach happy, right? So they're going to go out, they're going to participate, they're going to join in. And that traditionally under a lot of different decisions uh, is thought to be coercive. And the court has been rather rigorous in past decades of policing this. So the year I clerked, they had a case in front of them that involved student-led prayer at a football game. Um, so it wasn't actually an official of the school. It was students on their own, open mic night. You could pass the introduction to the football game around to different students. And this particular set of students led a prayer. And the Supreme Court said that is not okay because it is done in the presence of children who are influence, uh, subject to influence, they might feel coerced and they might feel because of the where this is happening that it is given the imprimatur of the state, of the school, and there's some entanglement. And so there was a longstanding test called the Lemon Test, subject to critique, but still longstanding for decades and decades that govern this, that said there should be no appearance of entanglement the Supreme Court overrules that effectively in, in Kennedy and Bremerton, along with calling into question a whole host of these decisions. But along the way, as you mentioned, the justices can't even agree on the facts. And that is something that is just, wow. I mean, when you read the, the dissent, it opens by saying, let us actually tell you what's actually happening in this case. And normally a dissent would just go straight into the law. There wouldn't be any need for facts. When I teach my Supreme Court seminar, I have students write an, an, a majority opinion and a dissenting opinion in a pending case. And I say, oh, the dissent can be shorter because you don't have to do the facts. They're already in the majority. But apparently now you do because the justices can't even agree on it. And so the majority opinion has one story about how these prayers happened and the dissent Sotomayor just says here's a picture and here's the coach at midfield with all of his team around him praying and apparently that's okay so to me what is most alarming about this is what does this mean going forward can teachers in public schools in a country that has in its very first amendment that we shall establish no religion can teachers now in the third grade during lunch say prayer circles over here? Anyone want to join? Apparently, you'll be, yes. You'll be interested, Amanda, that Australia borrowed the uh, anti-establishment clause in our constitution. We watered it down and then the Supreme Court, our equivalent, the High Court, watered it down some more. So actually some of what you're talking about is more familiar mm -hmm. to an Australian audience, but with a very different, obviously, cultural context where no teacher would do that. Oh, it will happen in the States. <laughs> Marcus, back to you. Yes. Change, yeah, but let me just stick with, with that for a second, right? So to what extent, and, and Roz's intervention on Australia, I think that matters, right? So the question is sort of how deeply embedded do we think religion actually is in a country and does that matter? Right. So in the US, when I was there, a lot of people, hay was made that the German government actually collects taxes for some of the, for the churches, at least for the for two established churches. Yet, on, so my own reading is that religion plays almost no role in public life, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in the US, it, it's at least in my perception, a much larger. You can't become president unless you profess some religiosity and at this point, Christianity. Do you think it seems like you're you see the trajectory of more religion in public life rather than less. That is permissibility. That is definitely where the Supreme Court is going. I, I think for years, we've seen case after case in the recent, I'd say 10 years, but even really in the last five years of acceptance, overturning precedent and acceptance of more and more religious and public mm -hmm. life. So just two very brief examples. Also this term, Maine is a very rural state. They have um, often given stipends to students to go to private schools in areas where they can't create a public school. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court says now you've got to give those stipends and allow them to use them in religious schools. So that's direct funding going to religious schools. That's new and quite, quite new. <laughs> Unprecedented, I guess, is the right way. You know, in an, a recent case, American Legion a few years ago, 
when Justice Ginsburg was still on the court, the court upheld on public land the funding and um, uh, uh, protection and maintenance of and, and allowed to continue uh, a, a cross as a war memorial that is, I can't remember, 100 feet tall or something. You can see it for miles. And you've got Justice Ginsburg, you know, in dissent saying, hi, hi, by the way, there are Jewish people in this country. And we don't think that that's okay. And it's kind of odd for you to say that the government can put this giant cross up and say that's our war memorial. Right. Um, so this is the direction we're going, for better or worse. Right. Uh, switching gears again, um, climate change, right? Uh, the weekend has been interesting, uh, at least. We see maybe some, uh, some change there with the, uh, the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which makes certain uh, uh, investments possible in with respect to climate change measures. But um, we've seen, again, going more towards sort of a jurisprudential uh, uh, side, and we've hinted at that, that the Supreme Court in West Virginia versus EPA and other cases around that sort of seems to want to gut, if you will, the power of the administrative state to make regulations, right? And maybe you can sh shed some light on what that discussion actually means with respect to a separation of powers and, and, and so on. Yeah, I think West Virginia versus EPA is quite significant. It's, I don't want to say the capstone because I think the court's going to go much further but it is an exclamation point underscoring another area of law where we're seeing a lot of precedents go down and really fundamental core precedents and core understandings of how the separation of powers and the administration, administrative state, excuse me, work in our country. So long-standing understanding, if Congress writes a law and it leaves a lot of room, it uses broad sweeping terms in the law, and leaves discretion as to how it might be interpreted and applied under so-called Chevron deference, uh, the, the administrative agency and the executive branch under the president's um, guidance or not, but usually, yes, there's some political change that will come in most of the agencies, can interpret and apply those laws as it sees fit, so long it's, as it's a reasonable interpretation of broad language. But now, for the first time, we're learning of this thing called the major questions doctrine. And it's, it's, it's not totally new, which is to say, uh, in a case called FDA versus Brown and Williamson, the FDA tried to regulate nicotine and cigarette smoke. And the court said, no, that's a really big deal. And there are hints of this idea, but they also say there's really just nothing in your statute that gives you this power. So that's in 2000, that's also the year I clerked. It was a very exciting year to clerk. Um, now what we see is Justice Gorsuch starting in the emergency vaccine cases saying we should have a so-called major questions doctrine. And if something's a really big deal, query how we decide that. What Roberts tells us in the West Virginia case is it's something if it has great economic and political significance which frankly I'd like to think is most things that are legislated about. Um, in any event, if something's a major question, he wants really specific textual hook in the law to say it's okay. So if, if EPA wants to start regulating climate change and, and sources and say, hey, we need to go all off fossil fuels, we really need some clear textual hook in the law that Congress passed empowering EPA to regulate emissions. We need something more. Mm -hmm. And you've got a dissent by Kagan saying, the law is written very broadly. And you're asked, and, and that we've always said is Congress's way of saying, we don't want to fine tune this. We want you as the experts to go figure this out. And, you know, on the one hand, you could say this is not a big deal because it means Congress can do the work and can pass laws to, to deal with each new crisis, et cetera. But the reality is, one, we have a dysfunctional Congress, notwithstanding recent developments, that doesn't confront a lot of things. And two, if the major questions doctrine, you know, coming at it from an area where I've written a lot about emergency powers, if the major questions doctrine is as broad as Gorsuch would have it, and one of the factors that he highlights in the OSHA case, in the vaccine case, uh, 
is if a law is really old and hasn't been updated, well then I think we have to revisit all of the laws that were passed 200 years ago about our militia, our armed forces, about all kinds of emergency powers because some of those laws haven't been touched in almost 200 years and they give sweeping authority to the executive to defend our country. And under this theory of the major questions doctrine, to my mind, they're all in jeopardy. Do I think the court will touch those laws? Probably not, but I think it should aspire for consistency. So the major questions doctrine is funny, right? Because lots of countries actually have something similar to this, right? So I'm German originally, and I'm, I'm just going to badger everyone with the Wesentlichkeitstheorie, uh, which is something similar to this. But it requires, I think, trust in the institution, right? And so that leads me to my next question, mm -hmm. right? So how trust in the institution is tricky uh, if we look at the standing of the court. And you've mentioned that before, right? It's, it's the lowest ebb. Um, uh, again, the German constitutional court somehow reaches 90% approval rating, which is unheard of, right? I think the Supreme Court at this point is what, 30-ish? Lower. Lower than that. Um, so there's a bit of controversy surrounding one of the justices, uh, Clarence Thomas and his wife, right? And her involvement in the January 6th uh, and lots of people's involvement. But in this particular instance, there's a direct connection between one of the agitators, if you will, uh, towards the January 6th uh, storming of the Capitol. I think that's the, the relatively neut neutral way to, to phrase it. And Clarence Thomas on the court. Does, if there was a case coming in that respect, does he have to recuse himself? He should, but he does won't. He have to? So in our country, the Supreme Court justices are not bound to the same code of judicial ethics as all other judges. They self-police. And I think this is an example demonstrating why that is not the right approach. He already uh, voted in a case involving issues that directly pertain to his wife's interests, and that was improper. Uh, just as a general ethical thing. I don't think I'm saying anything that's especially controversial, although he did it. So apparently it, maybe my view is controversial. Um, but because of that, I don't expect him to recuse from other matters. And I think this maybe is a wake up call that we need to not allow the Supreme Court justices to self-police anymore. As people may know in Australia, there's a very recent report of the Australian Law Reform Commission on Judicial Bias and Recusal, uh, where uh, Dean Andrew Lynch, Professor Gabrielle Appleby, and a number of others are extensively quoted. But it's a, a kind of a global issue around self-policing being the kind of default common law norm, and I think there's a lot of pressure on it. Um, and I don't think there's a better example of why that should be the case than um, Justice Thomas and Ginny Thomas's uh, involvement. We're almost out of time, so I'm just going to ask one more question and then open it to our online audience and to our in-person audience to ask one or two questions uh, of Professor Tyler. Feel free to put any comments or questions in the chat. Um, so you alluded at the beginning, Amanda, to the point about what happens next. Um, the December 2021 report of the White House Commission on the Future of the Supreme Court was very broad ranging in listing possible reforms to the shadow docket, to how uh, justices, um, you know, appointments are made, but particularly to the length or nature of the appointment. They also put on the table possibilities for and the constitutionality of efforts to increase the size of the court. Uh, what do you think is going to happen now that, I mean, at that time, a number of people, I, I would put myself in that category, say, well, we're not yet at court packing. Well, probably by August of 2022, if anyone was going to make the case, we could make the case now. What would be your prediction about uh, if there are going to be any institutional consequences for the US Supreme Court, other than a kind of slow petering in public support? Would you see there being a path to any of those changes after Bruin, after the EPA decision after Dobbs? So, I mean, it's really interesting to me because as I said, in 20 years of being a legal academic, we used to debate these theories and these ideas in my Supreme Court seminar, but not openly in the public domain. And now they're very seriously being debated. And I think that alone is an indication of where we are as a country and where the court is. In terms of the feasibility, 
you have to look at two different things. So what can you do through legislation and what requires amending the constitution? The constitution guarantees life tenure to all federal judges. So if you're gonna introduce say 18 year terms and a staggered system, keep nine justices, do 18 year terms, every president in four years gets two justices under that system, you have to amend the constitution to do that. And that may be the best system. I become somewhat convinced that's the best system because one of the things it has going for it is that everyone knows you're voting for president from X party, you're voting for two openings on the Supreme Court. And that way it's more transparent, it's more connected, it's less left to fate and health. More and, German. <laughs> <laughs> more orderly, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, but you have to amend our constitution to do that. That's a big deal, very rare to amend our constitution. But let's maybe come back to that. Let's not totally call that crazy in this day and age. Um, the other question is what can you do by legislation? And you can add justices. We started with six. At one point we had 10. We've had nine for over a hundred years. So that's been our norm, um, but it doesn't have to be nine. What is, the, what is the downside to that? I have a joke. Uh, you know, one party can add a bunch, the next party adds a bunch, the next thing you know, there are 100 justices. Why is this a bad thing? I say to my law students, maybe you and I will all wind up on the Supreme Court, it'll be great. Okay, but the joke aside, it's not funny because you could see how this could spiral and it's, it just becomes, now we have 30 justices or 31 justices. Um, and of course, India has had that model and it's not been a particularly happy one in terms of the stability of jurisprudence or the ability to predict outcomes. Right. And in the kind of current polarized context in the United States, it would be very manipulable. Yes, it would. Um, I'm not sure it's going to happen, even though I think there probably is increasing support for the idea, if only because our politics are so polarized and the Senate in particular is so closely divided, it would take a supermajority to get this through. And I just don't see that happening anytime soon. So then you come back to constitutional amendment. I start to wonder with all of these decisions, is there a point at which there might actually be, not to reform the Supreme Court specifically, but maybe one of these issues like guns, at some point is going to push a movement to revisit some of the constitution. And that, I, I mean, I have many colleagues who would say that's totally nuts, but I do start to wonder at some point, is there an issue? And I think guns is the one that might galvanize and or women's equality that might galvanize a new movement. I don't know. Well, you said we're going to end on a, an optimistic note. That's pretty close. We have three questions there I'm going to read out. Um, you know, John, definitely there's some um, possible sort of notes on that in the White House Commission report, which I'd really commend you uh, read in detail. So a few questions, um, a kind of trivia question, but an interesting one from uh, Justice Kuntz, which is if anyone was going to save nine in the current court and jump over and join Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts as a centrist willing to be a prudential kind of steward of the court's legitimacy, is there any one of the conservative justices who you could imagine jumping ship. And related to that from Jennifer, um, does Chief Justice Roberts have any power as Chief Justice to rein in the behavior of his colleagues, including Justice Thomas, Thomas on a kind of recusal style issue? So the chief actually, he has quite a lot of power in many respects, but not on that issue. He really can't, he can, say to him, you shouldn't sit in this case, it would be bad for the court, but it's ultimately up to Justice Thomas to decide in the same way that it's up to each individual justice to decide whether to sit in a case. It's the same here, yeah. So, um, boy, in terms of somebody to jump over, I, I think, you know, we're seeing the issues, um, how they play out on Native American issues. Neil Gorsuch is really good. He recognizes tribal sovereignty. He comes from a state where he had to, and a, he, to was, with it. he had yeah. to come to grips with it in his earlier judging in, on the appellate court. Um, so he's been really good on that issue. He's also been a textualist to the extreme, and sometimes that's been great for transgender uh, rights, transgender <laughs> yeah. rights, and employment discrimination. Um, so 
you know, I think in the statutory context, if you can make a play for textualism, you can pull him and or maybe Kavanaugh. Um, on the constitutional issues, I'm, I'm really quite pessimistic. I'm really pessimistic on, on the major issues that there is a bridge to be made. And there's a question, Amanda, from um, Professor uh, Lisa Arcioni at Sydney about the pushback to the political sphere. Can you predict whether the court would be interventionist to reduce structural flaws? There's a very interesting post in, a couple of weeks back by my colleague, Professor Tienis Rue on the Australian Pub Law blog, which uh, is one of the flagship kind of community um, events hosted by GNT, but everyone on this call probably has contributed to in some way um, that says, you know, there is a direct correlation. And when we think about Australia, there is much more structural intervention in our implied freedom of political communication and other contexts around the political process, which would distinguish the fact that even though we leave it to politics, we do it under a different framework. You know, I, I've been working with David Lano on this. It says, you know, if you were going to overrule Casey, you absolutely have to overrule Rucho. Uh, is there any likelihood of that? Ellie wants to know. This is another area in which the court has not been, in my view, going in the right direction in the midst of saying, uh, and it's a, it's a great question. I'm really glad to bring this into the conversation. In the midst, in so many cases of saying, let's send things to the political process, the court has retreated from protecting voting rights um, and doing it in the face of taking very narrow interpretations of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which is arguably the most important civil rights legislation ever passed in the United States. It starts in Shelby County, where the Supreme Court really guts the preclearance requirements that states that had long track records of racial discrimination and voting had to go through to make changes. It continues in the case of Rucho, where the court says, if you want to gerrymander and redraw lines for political purposes, no court, no federal court anyway, can check that. Uh, we'll see if state courts can. It looks like maybe they're going to say no state courts either. Um, all of this leads to very significant problems and questions about whether people who want to vote and who have a right to vote are always going to be able to vote. And that I don't see any room for optimism in that area of the law either. And that is what is, I think, the most depressing aspect of everything that's happening is it's one thing, whether you agree with it or not, to kick things to the political process, but it's quite another thing to do that and then not put guardrails in place to protect the right to vote, which is the cornerstone, obviously, uh, of, of the fair democratic system. And particularly in a country like ours, where there is a history of significant discrimination based on race and voting. And this is an example of what going back to one of the points I made at the outset about removing law in the books from law on the ground. So they had a case um, recently out of Arizona that had to do with Arizona redistricting and, and voting rights. And it was very clear that the changes being made were disadvantageous to Native Americans and their ability to vote. And the court upheld the changes. But if you look at the reality on the ground, it is so hard for Native Americans in Arizona to vote that making it harder is, is really just extraordinary. Well, there was a proposal uh, about 10 months ago um, in Australia to enact voter ID laws. And you know, a great deal of effort was put uh, into drawing to the attention of the then government the racial disparities, including in respective remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities that that law would have. And uh, you know, the Electoral Regulation Network, GNT Centre, and others put together a big argument that I think ultimately, along with many in civil society, persuaded the government to back down. But um, the US experience is definitely a salutary. Uh, lesson in that regard. Um, I want to thank Lizzie for posting that excellent piece by Tienis on the, the comparison. And of course, we have a number of our editors of that blog, including Lizzie, who's just stepped down and done a marvellous job. Thank you, Lizzie. Joffrey Carosi, our former editor and others on the call. Uh, we're now at, um, at time. Thank you, Marcus, for joining me in a great conversation. And most importantly, thank you, Amanda, for uh, basically being right off the plane and sharing such insightful and illuminating 
you know, comments about a court that we're all fascinated by, and I have to say, increasingly struggle to understand. But, uh, you know, if we have a chance of understanding it, it's through your lens. So thank you all so much. We're really grateful. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, and I believe that um, Amanda is going on to Canberra for uh, a celebration of the book with Justice Ginsburg. Uh, do you want to just tell us a bit about whether we can tune in to that uh, virtually? I'm not sure. Um, I'm speaking at the Canberra Writers Festival on Saturday about working with RBG on her book. Um, and then I'm also talking at Australia National University on Monday. I don't know if you can tune in. There might be a chance to join uh, virtually for the Saturday event. Uh, and can you give us um, just a quick uh, preview? Did you do yoga or weightlifting or Pilates with the justice? Yes or no? <laughs> no, but I did encourage her to get a treadmill during COVID and she did follow my advice, which I was, it's one, one of the few times she listened to me. <laughs> Well, very good advice. Thank you all to our online audience for hanging with us and, and joining us. We're very grateful as well. Thank you.